Thank you, John. I want to hand over to Suzanne to kind of take some questions from the floor. Sean, I can see you've got your hand up. Do you want to make a very quick point before Suzanne brings in the questions? Uh, yes. Connected with something. Um. So my, my name's Sean. I've yeah, sorry. I, I work in venture capital. I'm not. I'm not an activist. Okay. Um. I work in venture capital, and the thing about this this idea of reparations should we pay it or not? There's a there's already a precedent. Okay. There's already there are, there are other that you know. Um, African groups have been apologized in Kenya. The Aborigines have been apologized. The Irish have been apologized in the Caribbean for some strange reason. We, you know, we haven't been apologized. So, the, so, so in our eyes, the reason why reparations is important, because we, what we realized when David Cameron went down to the Carib, went to Jamaica to build a prison, right? What we, actually, what the governments realized, is we need to control the narrative. Because if, because if we don't control the narrative, then others will, make the stories for us. Thank you, Sean. And you, you've made some, some good comments in the chat as well. Brilliant. Suzanne, can I hand over to you now? Do you, there's been lots of uh, activity in the in the chat, I can see. Can I hand over to you to kind of field some questions for the panel for us? Yeah, definitely. I'll pick up um, questions. If I miss any, then please, you know, just um, raise your hand or send them again and I'll try and pick them up. But um, just when you were talking about what can be done. So Alex, you talked about government action. There needs to be government action. Um, and I can see a couple of questions on the chat about the tension between government action and the implications. So Peter Grant, he asks, what are the tensions between the roles of governments and individuals as both donors and recipients of reparations. How do we avoid reparations being at the expense of government development assistance for poorer countries? Well, that's, I think that's that's a, a really good a good point. And um, you know, and we all know that um, if if government gives with one hand, it tends to take with the other. And and even as this is this debate has been been going going on you know, in a more energetic way since twenty fourteen. Um, a British uh, uh, overseas aid to Caribbean nations has gone down by about eighty percent. So, so uh, I, I think I, there's a very strong argument. I, I think I, my, you know, I, I listen to reparations activists, and and, and, I, and I, I, I try. I'm learning I, I, that that whatever um, settlements eventually come out, and I think this will be very gradual, are, are not directed through government spending. Um, I think government has a role in negotiating, and and in the and obviously in in the apology and acknowledgement side, but but ultimately, um, I I I don't think our our the governments as as we have them at the moment all over the world are, are reliable enough to channel whatever flow of money comes through. But in terms of you know, I, I know a bit about the Church of England's hundred million pound reparations fund, which is just being designed at the moment. There's no intention of that being payments to governments. It would be payments to 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 um enterprises to to um educational charities and so on. I I I, I I think uh, having worked in for Oxfam, another white savior organization, you might say, um, for a while and seen how, you know, how aid at that level can go so badly wrong. Um, I, I think a new model for deliverance designed by those, the beneficiaries designed by the people in need is is what we need. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. So repaying so the beneficiaries getting together and devising a model so you know um just do this away from government really yes yeah yeah, yeah. And, and everything around this has to be designed by the descendants of those who were enslaved and, and 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 west africa as well from which people were kidnapped and taken in their millions yeah there's also an additional question about government so this is from jarette so she says Coming from the US, um, so sorry if some of the issues do not perfectly translate one to one, but she says, do you believe governing bodies keep refusing the recognition or acknowledgement of slavery because of political implication? And will it fast forward the process of return and redistribution? So I'm not sure um, who wants to answer that, whether it's you, Alex, or John. Sure. Robert? Sure, sure. Yeah, of course. There's political pressure all the time. Um, yeah. And um, I can't talk about it because I had to sign NDAs um, with the organisations that I've worked with. So I can tell you that there are there are major high street banks. There are major institutions who have looked into their past, um, done the uh, truth seeking, uh, but realised for a variety of political reasons they can't come out 
so to speak, because they worry about um, the political fallout. So that's real. But I think um, the good news is, is that if we had said this, uh, you know, 20 years ago, we put Lloyd Shipping in that category, you know, Lloyd's insurers in that category. And they next month have their first um, national uh, um, a meeting where they are going to talk about research they've conducted with John Hopkins University on their involvement in transatlantic chattel slave trade. So, you know, while there are organizations that feel they can't do it politically today, uh, you know, Lloyd's were like that 20 years ago, but now have moved on. So the hope is that the political climate will change and that organizations will feel more comfortable with um, acknowledging this past, opening up their archives and doing the restorative work. Yeah. Thank you, Robert. Um, there was also a question on what can be done. And um, John, you talked about making other descendants feel safe. So, you know, in a way, psychological safety. And I was quite struck when you were both talking, you were talking about, you know, the process that happens. So the fear, the risks, the shame that, that comes up. Um, John, you talked about um, Uncle Tom and his you know, not wanting to to get into the process, but then the documentary that I guess um, helped him to come to terms with the history, um, and and also you talked about um, the reward that comes from from doing this work. You know, just reconciling the family history and and feeling safer. So there's a question here about psychological safety and it's from Neil so he asks he says I'm interested in the psychological effects of 400 years of British Empire slavery and beyond on white British people is there scope for including this aspect in reparations Helen Morgan at Tavistock Clinic has written a book about the work of whiteness covering these psychological aspects I think that's a brilliant question. And I and it, it's been something that's come up quite a few times from from black groups that I've talked to have said, don't forget there is trauma on, on the on your side too. And when they first said that, I remember this say this being said to me and me thinking, what 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 trauma? And then of course, if you look into sort of any kind of psychology, you understand that the bully, the oppressor, the person who's behaved in a kind of in, in an inappropriate way they they also go through some kind of psychological damage by doing that. and i think we don't acknowledge as white people i'm speaking now on behalf of I guess white people that we don't acknowledge the damage that has been created over over many centuries by this and i do think that that takes its toll and i think that's something that's and i'm no by, by the way no at no point am i saying feel sorry for me because that's not why i'm saying it but i do think that we need to start acknowledging that this has been a traumatic centuries that has taken its toll on on everybody and I mean, the more that we can understand that and I also wanted to say something about apology, because for me, it's really interesting, this conversation about reparations. But I think we have to begin with apology, because at the end of the day, I don't think anyone anyone is rightfully going to accept the notion of reparation if they don't feel it comes from the heart. If they don't feel it comes genuinely from a place of humbleness and willingness to say bad things happened crimes of humanity were committed by our ancestors if we're not able to say that i don't think we can really move on in a meaningfully makes things better and i think their education is an education is really on them at school these about the colonialism they don't look about the terrible things people in this this, this country John, your your bandwidth is low again. I don't know whether you've just turned your camera off and continued to speak. Whether that might help. Can I can I take the space very quickly okay. <laughs> as a colleague? I, I think I mean I completely agree with John. But also, you know, there's an interesting term around. You know, and and Kendi Andrews has written a new book about it, white psychosis. And, and I think you know one of the first things that happened to me when I asked a friend, a black friend. When I started studying out of my project was four years ago, what I what she thought I should do with the, the history I was uncovering. And she said, I really don't want to hear any more about 
you know, the horrors of slavery. I've had, I've had, you know, I've had that all my life. What I want to do is know how you white people are going to heal yourselves, because you're still the problem. We're not. You're you're still making us making people suffer on grounds of skin color, and and part of your 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 illness is that you don't you still don't you're in denial about what happened in the past and you're in denial about what happens now and that was a really important thing to hear and it's something i repeat to people like me and, and i hope that, that that finishes john's answer right thanks alex yeah before i come to, to robert john do you want to just finish what you were saying um Sure. Yes. I mean, I, I think I was just really making I that's very, very important point. But also I was just pointing out about education. I do think education is a, is a great problem that we do not teach enough about this. People don't know about this history. You know, the, the reason why we're constantly asked, how come you're so late to this conversation? And I go, because I, I didn't know about it. And and even my family, which my family trumpeted its its uh, liberal values. It were my, my great grandfather was a was a Labour MP. He was in the education first education first Labour cabinet as an education minister. He he was he took you know if anyone talked about and so there's just been so many instances when families have either been ashamed or too proud to admit that their their involvement in slavery. And I just think it's. It's about time that we we just we're honest with ourselves, and I think that's what we are doing with Airs of Slavery. Mm -hmm. Suzanne, sorry, hand back to you. I was taking over a bit there. No, 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 that's fine, Adrian. I, I, so I was yeah. just going to chip in and just say there is a history of people asking this question and coming up with um, some solutions. Uh, you can go back a hundred years to Du Bois, uh, W. E. B. Du Bois, the most important African American intellectual of the twentieth century. He has a turn of the century, nineteen fifteen essay on the wages of whiteness, where he looks at the psychological and material benefits of white workers, white working class workers, from buying into the discourse of whiteness, and that's really the birth of whiteness studies to a degree. You can then go to the nineteen forties, nineteen fifties, and look at Franz Fanon, the uh, Martinican intellectual uh, psychologist and his work on looking at the Algerian war and dealing with the psychological problems that arose from the French uh, um, oppressors. And he, he catalogues the way in which oppression makes you sick, you know, and that's where to a degree the work of, before you get to Kindiadjus, the work of um, uh, Paul Gilroy, his book After Empire and the, you know, catchy subtitle, you know, Conviviality, and post-colonial melancholia. He uses 19th century psychological theories to explore the knee-jerk, irrational responses to dealing with colonial history. So again, there's people, you know, and then one could go to Delgado's work and others who deal with, you know, white fragility, which is often linked to racism, which is linked to this past as well. And what Kahindi attempts to do is much more popularist because it's, I, I know because I got a free copy. I know <laughs> quite well you know we all we all all we promise you know we all we all hang out well, <laughs> hang out together we always give each other free things because everything's free when you get north of Watford you know so I'm uh, I got a, a draft but his work is much more an attempt to deal with the irrationality and um and dealing with public figures you know Piers you know Piers Morgan isn't going to give you a lot of uh, you know sense on, on this issue so but again recognizing that there's a psychological damage hence reparations as a restorative program has to be about everybody it has to be about healing on all sides and that's why i said before it is a journey it, you know it, into into transformation mm. yes it, it, and it's so unhealthy you know, it's so unhealthy of us of white people to sit and go we're going to help with reparations in order to help black people it this is for this is for everybody it's for healing us because it, you know until that happens until we heal everybody we won't, we won't move forward mm. thank you thank you um, there's another question here from Raymond Smith. Um, so this was in response to what can be done. So the question is, what are the channels and how do we accelerate the process? And I believe this is in response to talking about government action and, you know, what can be done. I think that's a Robert question. Well, well, I well I'd like to hear what Robert well, thinks. Well, well, look, I think we still, I, I mean, I'm working with the... Um, you know, the, as much as I can do with the cross-party group in Parliament, you know, Bel Riberio, Ade, Diane Abbott and uh, others, David Lammy and a couple of Conservatives who were signed up uh, uh, um, to, to the, um, were sponsored the organisation, at least of well, the, the group forming. I think it's uh, working with them 
uh, in terms of accelerating it, working with them, hoping that we get a change in government. I think it's also supporting the CARICOM plan in terms of um, doing as much as possible to ensure that their message and all of its different facets is, is, um, is heard. There's also some independent actors in this field as well. People like the Irish billionaire, uh, Darian, uh, not Darian O'Brien, it's um, uh, Dennis O'Brien, oh, there you go, Dario, Dennis, Dennis O'Brien, there you go. Um, I've confused him with the rugby player, but I'm, uh, you know, so I'm, uh, so, uh, and his plan is much more investment based, you know, it's a bit more capitalistic, but I think, so I think where necessary supporting, where necessary challenging, but being, in, and, and all, but always being in critical solidarity with those who are trying to do work in this field. That, that's really, really important. Um, in t I, I don't know how much more we can accelerate it because, um, it, you know, these, it's a process, it takes time. But what I think we should see more of is more popular um, uh, programmes, uh, art, newspaper articles, writ written text, uh, everything, exploring dimensions of this and just saying how much of the, this history is entangled with our present lives. The Cotton uh, Capital series in The Guardian attempts to do that really well. And occasionally you get, um, you know, there was a radio documentary on Radio 4 um, looking at reparations a while ago, but there's not enough on colonial history and all of its complexity and its, its globality. And that's part of the a tragedy of I think our educational system and consequently it leads into a very kind of my, a myopic understanding of history and a very inward looking um, politics which which you know we've seen manifest you know recently through things like Brexit as well so so I don't know how much we can put the foot down apart from supporting the real agents of change like the uh, political groups that are working on this. Mm. Thank you Robert. And just bringing in a question from Shadona Kettle. So she's a doctoral researcher based at UCL. Um, she says this is a growing movement. So have you considered bringing in other groups, so liaising with other groups in Europe or individuals, um, you know, just to 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 boost this this movement? Yeah, maybe I could speak to that. Um, we have been approached, um, you know, through 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 our work by by journalists from many countries, uh, Germany. Um, I've got an interview with Sweden, to, I think it's next week, Swedish TV, Denmark um, and France. And interestingly, there is, um, it's slow, I think, in France, but there is a reparations movement growing in France and we are going to go and meet them, we hope, in uh, December. And these are two guys that come from Nantes, which is on the West Coast. 43% of out during what it was the biggest link uh, ports such as Bristol and Liverpool and we are um, a descendant of um, families that own ships and also um, a descendant of from Martinique as I remember it yes so certainly we are starting to reach out into other countries and I hope that that will grow I think that's I think we should really be, um, and ideally, I would then like to. Still, I think those are the kind of links that we should start to grow, start to make more of. Mm. Yeah, see, when John says a reparations movement, he means a, a, a heirs acknowledgement movement. Not, not, not the reparations movement is is obviously a, a separate thing that we we yeah. try, try to support. You no, know, it's really, it, and of course there are groups like as of Slavery in the States already, um, two or three, and, and quite active ones. Um, and, and, and reparations is moving ahead in the states uh, it, it, on a city by city basis in really quite an interesting way. But it's more reparations around the Jim Crow era and and damage done on racist grounds to to to, to um, communities of color in the twentieth century. But but there are models there, and of course the thing that you know comes up again and again is. In, and one's told is not discussable, but the, it, it, it's the fact that there has there was in in the twentieth century a successful act of apology, contrition, and reparations between the German the German government and the Jewish people, and and so he, he, which he, which he is worth analogizing with though 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 the, the, the one tends to be told not to, but actually it is an example of how two nations can come through a genocide, a, a crime against humanity, and end up uh, at in some some form of peace with each other without in any way denying what denying what happened. Um, 
I find that really encouraging. I also, I mean, also the other thing I find, and Robert and I've spoken about this before, is it I'm I'm a, you know, of a generation. I mean, lots of us here today are that that were students during the anti-apartheid movement and remember the grassroots support from a hugely diverse range of people in Europe and particularly in Britain with its colonial history for the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa that brought about change where many people on the right, the old white right said it would never, could not happen and would never happen. And, and we made it happen. And I think another thing as allies, you know, and particularly with our, our in is, is think how we can support this becoming an issue for our, for our kids, um, you know, the sort of thing they go to rock festivals and, and, and shout about. Um, and because that's how, in the end, you get governmental change. It's from from the grassroots, in a diverse way, middle class, working class, you know, and every other diversification. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So the movement is galvanizing um, as we as we speak. So there are links with you know in France and other movements at the moment. Um, there's a really interesting question here from Davinia Reynolds. So she says. There are many people who have not met individuals from families who have benefited from transatlantic slavery and the documentary Professor Robert made communicated effectively and galvanized many people across the Caribbean. For these reasons, I'm wondering what needs to take place so public apology or acknowledgement for everyone could take place. Similarly, do you think a documentary showing more beneficiaries addressing what happened could model addressing reparations to other beneficiaries and go towards it becoming less like the unknown and make it seem more doable and more accessible? So it's quite um, a full question there, two questions in one, I guess. So um, so who wants to, <laughs> to take that one to answer that one? I mean, Robert's the documentary maker, and and you've 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 made that documentary. Is there any taste for any more? Do you think? Uh, I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. I mean, I mean, I I, I mean, I, I pitched a couple of projects, but I'm too old and too ugly for Channel Four. So it may be something that ends up on radio. To be quite honest, but I think Davina's is completely right. Um, I think we need to really keep winning the cultural battle so to speak in terms of making sure that people are aware of the history uh the issues i think the second part of the question yes there was the trevelyan um film that bbc bbc made but i think more films like that especially dealing with the practicalities would be good there's also the harewood um uh, a film where david harewood uh, goes to harewood house as part of one of his um film projects but i think i think the more of this that we can have the more it becomes normal and yes. less marginal, but becomes part of our public discourse in, in the same way that um, it's, it's not completely comparable, but the way in which the statue debate in the southern states in America was once very, very marginal, but has now become much more central, more normative, and people understand the history and they can understand why um, these um, statues were put up as acts of, you know, psychological terror, rather than being acts of historical, you know, a recognition. And therefore, we're able to make, in, in, in many of the southern states, make that move to have the statues removed. So it is still about conscientizing, maybe making people aware. So, yes, I would like to see much more of it. Mm -hmm. And then also, John, you talked about, you know, standing in Jamaica and having that public apology. I think you're still there and how powerful the apology was, um, you know, to the recipients. Are you still there, John? Yes. I think, I think we've finished. lost John yeah but um it's a, a very powerful point about you know having this discourse and and just making it become you know more um I guess normalized to people so that you know we have this um this this um interaction yeah um I'm just scrolling through questions just three more minutes Suzanne before. yeah yeah um, I know Wanette made a comment earlier, so she talked about, um, was it chocolate? So the idea of um, milk chocolate started in Jamaica. Um, I'm not sure if you're there, but Wanette. I am, Suzanne. Yeah. Um, basically, I was saying that I'd um, booked a tour of Yes. And the tour guide um, 
brought that bit to get your chocolate bar on the shelf now, on the shop shelf. The, the actual idea started to be I was quite chuffed about that coming from Jamaica. There's a comment here from Raymond. So um, I know, Robert, you talked about um, reparation. So the five levers that you use, you talked about um, the spirituality. So how important that is, the Rastafarian movement. So Raymond comments, you know, apart from any moral imperative, he's glad he brought up the God factor. So God requires and blesses us to do justice for wrongs. So do you have any comments around Raymond's comments at all? Yeah, look, um, I don't think religion and even Christian theology is outside of this debate, partly because of the, our country's history and entanglement with Christian Christianity, the legal structure, the understanding of um, rest restoration, the way in which that impacts even the criminal justice system, you know, the reformatory uh, tradition. Um, so so um, it, it's very much integral with um, how we think about the nation, how we think about justice, how we think, therefore, about um, um, the, the the pathway towards um, um, reconciliating uh, this particular, reconciling this particular history. Um, I, I think what I would add is this, in terms of the, the the spirituality of it, is that I don't think we can do it without the support of religious groups. You know, because it's, it has a similar, there are similar traditions within Islam the tr similar traditions in in um, um, Hinduism, you know, so it is very much something that we can pull other religious groups into. And also we should, uh, you know, deny the fact that it's religious groups who are driving it. The Church of England here in uh, the UK, in North America, it was the Jesuits, one of the first major, uh, you know, institutions to come out and offer a form of reparation, compensation for its role in using slave labor as part of its uh, mission in the Americas. So, yeah, so that's what I would say. You know, I think it's um, we can't leave religion out of it. And we also need to pull uh, religious traditions into this debate and into this discussion. But it's also, you know, to do a Barack Obama, it's about people of faith and people of no, of no faith as well. Mm -hmm. Could I say briefly that I, I, I've been, uh, as Robert knows, and, and maybe all of you know, the the uh, the, the uh, Church of England is currently designing it, its perpetual fund as for uh, enslavement repair repair fund, uh, and and having great debates about how how what shape that should take and how it should deliver deliver its money. But um, the and the. They they have just started a survey of really everyone who's interested in, from whatever angle in this in the area of, of colonialism and its legacies um, on how how that fund should work and what issues need to be addressed. And I might paste that into the meeting group chat because I uh, because we've been asked to distribute it around people. So and and that you know we could come back to the the role of the, the role of religion in in the enslavement period and and in and in addressing the legacies and healing and and the church. Of England initiative, which is hugely controversial because there are a lot of very right wing people within that church uh, who don't like this idea, but is also a really interesting idea for so something that many other churches could emulate and follow and acknowledge, and other institutions in terms of making a real difference um, in 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 the reparations field. Yeah, and Alex, you alluded just then to healing, so I just wanted to read out a comment from Susan. So she says. Thank you so much for this. My family is from Grenada. It's good to hear about this happening. Also knowing that the, there are those who want to be actively anti-racist is very encouraging and healing. So I just wanted to read that out before we, we close. Mm. 